This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 54, recorded on March 22nd, 2013. Hi, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Howdy. How are you doing? Welcome back. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've been away a while, but things are fine. Did you enjoy our talk with Joe Ellen? Oh, I did. Or I'm Ellen. sorry I missed that. Sorry. That was fabulous. Ellen Joe, yeah, right? Ellen, yeah, Ellen we had, Joe. We had a good time. Yeah. She's very articulate and very lively. Also joining us today from the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, Michael Schmidt. Hello, Ayo and Vincent. It's good to be with you today. How's it down there? Is it hot? Is it summer? No. It's, it's, um, uh, winter has returned. I think March came in as a lion and is going out as a lion. It's, <laughs> it, it was cold at the beginning of March and it seems to be cold at the end of March. So, and yesterday was two days ago uh, was the first day of spring, right? Oh, yes. And we have plenty of pollen flying around, but oh, it, yeah, it, yeah. it's, it could be yellow snow for all I know. It's so cold. <laughs> Yeah, it's chilly. Four degrees Celsius here in New York, and I'll bet it's 21 degrees out in San Diego. Yes, indeed. Something like that. <laughs> always nice out there. Uh, who, who knows? It's always nice. Take it for granted after a while, I guess. Well, we've had a couple of episodes with guests, and now we're going back to um, looking yeah, at a few we're papers. back to our old, old habits, aren't we? Yeah, we'll have some more guests, but uh, right. it's good to mix it's it up. It's nice to take a break. Nice to take a break. It's good to mix it up. Yep. Today we have two papers, and the first one is a paper from Cell with the interesting title of Tit for Tat, Type 6 Secretion System Counterattack During Bacterial Cell-Cell Interactions, and this is from Basler, Ho, and Mechalanos. Very interesting one. Yeah. And Ayla, you're going to tell us all yeah, about it's this? it's quite a paper. I'd like to back on this a little bit and mm -hmm. make the observation that uh, bacteria are very adept at secreting proteins. And do this for a variety of reasons. Some are nutritional. When they find themselves in an environment with macromolecules, they do, can, do not usually swallow them, although with some exceptions, <laughs> like DNA. <laughs> but they usually like to break this stuff down. So out they spit extracellular hydrolases, and they break down the polymers, and they can be polysaccharides or proteins or nucleic acids, and then they take low molecular weight nutrients, which is very convenient. In other words, they have an external stomach. Uh, that's one way. And then, of course, they also make toxins. Now, toxins uh, are, of course, related in our minds to infection. And that's true. But it turns out that they are more, it's more complicated than that. And today we're going to see how bacteria make toxins that work on other bacteria. But here's the point. Uh, if you just were to secrete a toxin, like they say in the case of diphtheria bacilli or botulism or uh, tetanus, um, if this is simply secreted into the medium, you have to make a huge amount of these proteins or uh, engineer the proteins to be extraordinarily active. So the ones I mentioned are, in fact, active at a very, very low level. But in a way, this is wasteful. So there is another mechanism which has evolved, and that is for bacteria to stick to their host cells and have a mechanism for injecting directly the toxin into the host cell. Now, notice that is delivering the bullet to its target instead of just a shotgun approach of just trying to cover the, the whole panorama with pellets or bullets. This is to go straight at the cell that you want to hit. So bacteria, in fact, a lot of pathogens have such systems. And the... Uh, I'm sure many of the readers know this, but just to repeat it, 
there's a whole variety of system for protein secretion. Some are pretty simple. They are really just making a hole in the membrane through which the proteins can pass. Others are very complicated and they look like little machines reminding one of uh, bacteriophage uh, structural elements. So they are a little, like, a little bit like just in the same sense that the bacteriophage acts in a way like a syringe. Uh, these, these little gadgets also act like a syringe. In other words, they are made usually as a response to contact with the target cells. They're not made all the time. They're made with contact with the uh, in contact with the target cells. So there is a, a regulatory mechanism to turn them, turn these genes on to make these machines, and then the machines penetrate into the host cell and spew out toxins into the host cell. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. Got it. Anything, anything I left out, uh, Michael? I you think uh, the best way of looking at it is a true guided missile. Okay, okay, that's good. A wire guided missile. What are you it? saying it's a drone, Michael? It could be a drone. Well, no, no, because it's it's still attached to yeah. the sentient. If if you're going to give uh, the microbe sentient and being a sentient being, it's still attached to the microbe. Yeah, right. So it's not like a throw and go where the drone. It's really short distance, right? Yeah. Alio, yeah, sure. Alio, do any of these inject things into eukaryotic cells? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, this is where toxins end up. Okay. This is what the E. coli and Shigella does, and Pseudomonas does that. So it doesn't it, distinguish between a bacterial and a... Oh, no, there are different, there are different varieties of this mechanism. In fact, the secretion mechanisms are numbered with Roman numerals, just like the Super Bowl, and right now they go from one to six, and we're going to talk about type six secretion today. So there's a whole variety of them, and in fact... Uh, some uh, bacteria, like the ones we're going to talk to about today, have within each class, like a type 6 secretion system, they have more than one. And they're not redundant. Uh, so this is an elaborate mechanism. This is an elaborate story where bacteria have more than one of these particular mechanisms. They may have other type secretion mechanisms in addition. So this is really a big deal. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of genomics is expanded, expanded in um, expanded in coding for these proteins, and so they are important because otherwise they'd be lost in evolution. Yeah, this is a major mechanism for uh, delivering toxins. As I said, it's a very efficient one because you can you only need a few molecules as opposed to a toxin which is secreted in general into the medium, where you need oodles and oodles and oodles of it. Mm. Okay, so now the story, that's sort of the background that we teach medical and dental students and other unsuspecting people. But uh, in addition to that, it turns out that these secretion mechanisms work between bacteria. And this was discovered some time ago in Michelanos' uh, lab at Harvard and has been followed up by quite a few people. And I got to tell you, the literature on type 6 secretion is pretty powerful. There are review articles about it already. It was discovered in 2006. So it's a very new story. Was it 2006? Yeah, 2006 sounds right. So it, that's it's right. recent. It's recent. It's recent. And it's already a major field. So types, tune in on type 6 secretion. Don't see it just like an aberration, a little off a story that's off in a corner. This is very central. All right. So... The story is that type 6 secretion, which is present in uh, the majority of the proteobacteria, you know, a large group of uh, bacteria which include many pathogens, and is even found outside of the proteobacteria. In fact, something like 25% of all bacterial genomes contain genes for type 6 secretion. But as I say, it's particularly notable in things like uh, Salmonella, Shigella, E. coli, Pseudomonas, Vibrio, that sort of organism. These are commonplace organisms that we call, that we lump in the um, proteobacteria. So what do they do? Well, it turns out that they will, uh, some of these bacteria, for instance, Pseudomonas, will attack not uh, it, its own bacteria. It's, it will attack its sisters. And, uh, but the sisters and themselves have an antitoxin against the toxins that are delivered, so not, nothing happens. So there's sort of a, 
a game going on, but oh, it's of no consequence. What is of consequence, if you take Pseudomonas and Vibrio cholera, and the Pseudomonas now will affect the deliver toxins via type 6 secretion to the Vibrio and kill it. Okay, So that is interesting, and it is part of really the new way of thinking. The new way of thinking is that no bacterium is an island. And bacteria are, in fact, uh, good at talking to each other. And what the consequence, what the way to think about it is that an awful lot of bacteria live in biofilms. They live on surfaces, because these phenomena require cell-to-cell -cell contact. Therefore, they must happen when bacteria are close to each other. In a liquid environment, they are usually not so close. They divide and they swim apart or they move apart. But on biofilms, they stay put. And biofilms are probably, not clear to me, but it's probably the default mode. In other words, the most, most bacteria on Earth probably live in biofilms. And this may include even in the ocean and in lakes and rivers because there are particles like uh, the shells of little... Uh, crustaceans or whatever, and a lot of bacteria live on that. In the seas, this, this is an aside, by the way, but in the seas, there's a thing called marine snow, which is a bunch of chains of polysaccharides, which look like, uh, not like snow exactly, but like braided, not like, like chains of stuff, and bacteria stick to that. So anyhow. Almost like, almost like gauze is the way almost I... Almost like gauze. That's good. That's good. Very good. Anyhow, the point is, since bacteria often uh, are in touch with one another, not just of the same species, but of different species, there is an intense communication between them. And it takes on all sorts of forms and shapes. And this is just one of them. So think of type 6 secretion as a form of bacteria talking to other bacteria. So the story is that there is what they call a dual, because if one bacterium... Uh, delivers toxins to another one by type 6 secretion, the other one of a different species retali retaliates. It has its own type 6 secretion, and it goes back to the original giver of the goodies and attacks it. So there is a, it's like a complicated, this becomes very complicated, and in fact, uh, although uh, Mechelano's lab and some people in Europe, especially in Marseille and other places, are studying this quite intensely. We still don't have the details illustrated. Let me, before I go into the details, but however, let me tell you what this seems to be about. If you, if the, let's call it donor and recipient, although that's the wrong term, but let's just call it that. The donor, like say, like uh, Pseudomonas, will only deliver by type six, by the type six mechanism, to a vibrio which has a type six mechanism. If the vibrio does not have it, is mutated in that, nothing happens. The pseudomonas will not deliver its toxins to that cell. The way I looked at it is, it was almost like mutually assured destruction. You would only nuke a nation state that had nukes. You wouldn't nuke a nation state that didn't have the particular weapon That's and right. it was in it and it's really a, a a neat way that the microbe ignores the um, community i think uh, or the the other member the, of the, the innocuous community. community the innocuous, yeah, the innocuous community. community right and that and it and it's it gives a whole new meaning to communication because they know the the capability or the intent of the offender. That's right. That's right. It's really, it's, it's quite unexpected, let's call it. But it really works that way. It seemingly works that way. And this is what this paper uh, does. And uh, what they call dueling in other papers, they call tit for tat in, uh, in this paper. The title, I think you read it, tit for tat, type 6 secretion system, counterattack during bacterial cell-cell interactions. So this is really fascinating and way more intricate and complicated than uh, anybody would have thought. So how does this work? Well, the mechanism seems to be that, and by the way, let me emphasize the type 6 translocation 
only works when cells are in contact with cells. It's true for a few other mechanisms. Type 3 and type 4 work the same way. They don't waste their time unless there is a cell next to it. So this is, there is a cell contact sensing mechanism, which, which is at stake here. So the machinery is complex. Uh, it has uh, some 13 core subunits, a whole bunch of proteins. And um, these proteins are novel in the sense that although they look like uh, phage components, phage tails, uh, under the microscope, they really look like it. Uh, there is no uh, homology between any known virus or phage tails and these proteins. And uh, because they are, so the, one doesn't know where they come from. Probably they came from a phage, but we don't know what the phage is or where, it, where it's to be found. So we have can, can only assume that because of the morphological homology, there ought to be genomic homology with somebody indicating their origin and evolution. But uh, and because there are several of these machineries, of these machines in one cell, one assumes that some of them may have been acquired by horizontal gene transfer, but who knows. Anyhow, the genes are tightly clustered, the genes that encode for the uh, type 6 secretion. Uh, the average clusters are about 20 kb, and as I say, they're very prevalent. Um, they uh, fall into five distinct phylogenetic groups, and I don't know what to make of it. Anyhow, they, are, uh, they transport at least two proteins. One is called hemolysin coregulated protein, abbreviated HCP, and the other one is a valine glycine repeat protein G. Anyhow, they are co-exported together, and they are part of the extracellular portion of what goes out. And they resemble some of the, let's see, the tail, um, uh, some of the tail apparatus, tail tube of a phage and the tail spike, which is something that is delivered when the phage infects a cell. Uh, Vincent, you're the virologist here. You want to say something about that? Yeah, we actually <laughs> did a, uh, uh, an episode on the tail spike structure uh, some time ago. I don't know if either of you remember. Actually, maybe uh, you weren't here, but... Uh, they've just solved the tail spike structure. And it's an interesting trimer, I believe, that is attached to the bottom of the tail of the neck. Or I guess it's the tail of the phage. And this is jammed into the membrane when uh, the right cell is uh, encountered and makes a hole so the nucleic acid can pass through. It's really an mm -hmm. amazing structure. It looks just yeah. like it looks just like a spike. The, the yeah. protein structure is sharp at the tip and, and expands uh, upwards. So what came first, do you think, Vincent? Ah. Do you think the the type 6 secretion apparatus and the viruses co-opted it to make the tail, or did the bacteria take the tail from the virus in order to yeah. make type 6 secretion? I, it's exactly what I've been thinking about as, as Elio was talking about this. I, I don't know, and I don't think that we can tell. I mean, maybe the fact that it's not it doesn't have any sequence a relationship to any phage means that it's more ancient, but uh, it could go either way, right? It could, but I don't know. I I, I put my dime on the phage. The phage was first. Was <laughs> first. I, I somehow. Yeah, I, I, I would. I would put my money on the on the phage as the the microbe becomes more specialized in living in a, in a biofilm, and the, you know, it's 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 almost the. Uh, akin to the pathogenicity islands that are really genomic islands yeah. and and you know how the the phage effectively sneaking their their DNA into the uh, you know flanking the tRNA genes that were dispensable because the codon bias of the cell I think it would probably argue that um, the bacterium co-opted from an aberrant excision from a phage and, you know, the rest is fitness. Maybe. Yeah, I think this is, uh, we, need, we need a beer to go over this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is not uh, something one can discuss just like that. Next time we are together and we have a beer, we go over it yeah, again. Yeah, sure, that's a good idea. Anyhow, the paper is... Um, quite intricate, there's a lot of detail in it, and I don't think I want to go into much more, 
uh, except to say that there are some uh, illustrations that are very lovely. A lot of this work is done using fluorescent labels uh, bacteria, using red for one, or green, uh, green for another. And uh, you can see vividly what happens. And there's also several movies that show that. Oh, and speaking of movies, there's something I don't think I've seen often in a paper. But in when you get to this paper in cell, one option you have, I think it's in the supplemental material, is to see a movie, a little video clip of John McAllanos talking about this. Right. Now, this is wonderful. I think this is now. Is this something new? Have you ever seen? Yeah, these uh, are. There is a, these are called paper flicks, and Sal has just started including I them. See. I've seen a what few. What do you others. think of that? It's, I like it. I think it's a way for the authors to communicate, and uh, I think more people should do it. Sure, I think it's great. I think it's great. That uh, have you seen that, Michael? Yes, and I I agree with Vincent. I think uh, not that they go too long or too much into the weeds. It it, it really has to give you the fifty thousand foot overview. Yeah. Um, They're short. It's five minutes. Yeah, it's very yeah, good. it's perfect. Well, I think it's going to alter a little bit how we read the literature because we're being guided that way, which is fine because nobody can do it any better than the author. Right. So right. I, I'm, I'm all for it. I think this is a good idea. Elio, let so, me ask you: um, in this pairing, Pseudomonas versus Vibrio, why does Vi why does Vibrio always lose? <laughs> well, uh, let's see. There is an argument here, and that is that Vibrio. I, yeah, you would ask. It's a complicated story. <laughs> uh, the two are not equal in potency, the two systems. I see. Mm. I don't remember. I, 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 I'm sorry. Well, I don't remember. Here, which here's, my, here's my speculation is that Vibrio has two chromosomes. So it, ah. it may not be genetically as robust in terms of expressing. Remember, when you have two, you have to efface the chromosome so that you get expression of genes in response to signals that the microbe perceives. It, whereas Pseudomonas, uh, at least in this partic particular case, Originosa, only has one chromosome, but there are you know, some other Pseudomonas-like friends, like Burkholderia, that have, have two chromosomes. And we haven't ever really discussed you know, why bacteria would want to have Two chromosomes and whether or not they're they're not as evolutionarily as robust as the microbes that have only one chromosome where they put everything into one package so that may be one of well, i think that's certainly possible and i think it's it's clever of you to mention that uh but there is in the paper talk of this and i'm frantically leafing through it and i'm sorry to say i can't find it <laughs> so anyhow if you uh, those the readers or listeners who want to uh, look into that will find a statement in the paper which says why pseudomonas and vibrio are not are not the same thing one of the things i i liked and it's worth noting they mentioned that so vibrio is always firing this type 6 system kind of randomly all over its membrane, yeah. right? right? But right, Pseudomonas right. is very patient and waits right. for an attack, right? That's right, that's right. So when you that's mix them right. together, Vibrio is punching Pseudomonas, and then Pseudomonas punches it back and kills right. it. And uh, it injects something in that makes the Vibrio swell and break, right? That's right. It is, well, the things that are injected, and I didn't really say, but there are things that degrade peptidoglycan, for instance. Yeah. So, uh, probably... Uh, Kind of enzymes that are famous for in uh, in, in cell wall metabolism. Uh, so yeah. Oh, well, one thing I didn't say is that the um, I, I'm sorry. I'm going back to uh, the analogy they make between the the way the tail contracts when it does the secreting. They call this like a crossbow. Hmm. Which is nice. It's nice. It propels the uh, the tail tube through the. Right. Uh, right. Victim. So, why is it that some bacteria like Pseudomonas have evolved to be to control their type six injector, whereas Vibrio is just shooting it all over? And clearly, in this pairing, Pseudomonas Vibrio, Vibrio loses. But I mean, in nature, Vibrio must win sometimes, right? So, obviously, that has some advantages, I guess. 
Yeah, well, I gotta say that I don't think that Bible and Pseudomonas meet all that often. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Yeah, <laughs> certainly not in the not in the host, although maybe in soil. The, the Vibrio is not color. The Vibrio is that in soil, and so the monas is a soil organism, uh, maybe. I don't know, Mike. Do you have any any thoughts about that? You know, you know. Uh, all no, and and it it may be. You know, uh, John Michelanos is an old Vibrio microbiologist. He's he's worked on Vibrios for quite some time, so it may be. Um, you know, one of those uh, happy circumstances where you mix. And, you know, you have Pseudomonas in the lab and you have Vibrio in the lab and you say, yeah. what, what, what will happen? And I think that's part of the key of, of this paper is that they, they do have um, a remarkable uh, phenotype in that the Vibrio is the weaker, weaker player. And right. when I was reading it, I was getting the, this metaphor of jousting where, where you, have the very, um, you have the very strong knight on the horse charging down, and it effectively, you have the other organism in, and the weaker knight being Vibrio that has its, its uh, jousting um, probe out there, and, and the Pseudomonas is, is able to uh, knock the Vibrio off its horse, and the poor knight explodes, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. They also say so. They also talk about and have data about how the uh, the, the vibrio is sensed, how the type six is sensed. Apparently, it involves swirlation of a of a scaffolding protein. Right. You know that's pretty cool. Yeah. But they do say that vibrio kills E. coli a hundred thousand times more efficiently than Pseudomonas does, because vibrio has this very active type six thing that's always shooting out all over the place, which fires and reforms all over. But Pseudomonas versus Vibrio, the, there's a clear. Uh, it's not. I'm. I'm a, yeah, as I say, I have to reread the paper, and I'm sorry I it escapes me. But there's a reason given for this. Yeah, I didn't. Re I don't remember it, but yeah, maybe some listener will will pick it up. Okay. <laughs> so nice. they, 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 you know, they close with this idea that these effectors, these type six uh, secretion sisters, may be really important for nutrient scavenging rather than killing. Yes. Because they yes. because the bacteria will then eat what, what they kill. Is that does that make sense? Well, but that's still killing. Yeah, know? right. <laughs> <laughs> I kill you I kill you because I want your food or I kill you for some other reason, you're still dead. <laughs> but did people yeah. really think that that uh, lethality in its own right was a was a goal? Well this is uh there's a huge literature on that developing. Yeah. Um, cannibalism is a big item, and we ought to discuss it sometime because, especially in B. subtilis, it's being studied in great detail by people like Kit Poliano's lab, and uh, there is a great deal developing that way. Plus, also, uh, program cell death uh, is studied by Hannah Engelberg Kulka and others, many others. All these things are related, and some of them are probably related to nutrition, others to something else. Mm. So the, um, the number of mechanisms that exist for hurting your neighbor is really huge. The, other, the arsenal is immense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we have to we just uh, let's, let's see this paper in context of a large sure. uh, number of strategies that have evolved. They also mentioned the, uh, of course, Pseudomonas is a mammalian pathogen, and they say it would be interesting to determine whether eukaryotic signals can induce a counterattack in Pseudomonas. Yeah. So not just Actually, Pseudomonas <laughs> not just a, a, a... Pseudomonas is about as broad a pathogen in terms of host range as there is. Yeah. I mean, worms, flies, uh, invertebrates of all sorts, and of course vertebrates. You know, it's all over the place. So, I had a good time with this paper. Okay. It's a good one. I like that. Anything from you to close it out, Michael? No, uh, I think that you know it, it. It's not your father's microbiology any longer. It's it's <laughs> it's really evolving, and I think this next paper that we're going to do will really drive that home even further. It's a brave new world. You bet. Yes. Yes, indeed. All right. Our next paper is from Science. It is called "Sex Differences in the Gut Microbiome." Drive hormone-dependent regulation of autoimmunity 
And the authors are Markle, Frank, Martin Toth, Robertson, Fiesel, Roll, Kempsick, Von Bergen, McCoy, McPherson, and Danska. And this How is Michael going to segue this from the previous paper? I don't I'm know. very curious to know. I don't know. How are well, you going to do it, Michael? <laughs> well, um, this is a... Uh, there, there also is a perspective uh, that is written in, in the same issue of Science on, on this paper called Welcome to the Micro Gender Dome. And uh, I did not coin that term. It, it was coined by uh, Magdalena Flock, uh, Joanna Neves, and Richard Bloomberg, um, also of um, Harvard. And this particular paper is really pretty remarkable in that um, it talks about type 1 diabetes and it uses a, a model system, uh, specifically the non-obese diabetic mouse or the NOD mouse. And these mice naturally develop uh, type 1 diabetes where their immune system comes in and takes out the pancreas's ability to make insulin. So, if you will, they become insulin-dependent diabetic mice. And uh, this develops spontaneously in this particular animal model. And so, what these authors have, um, I think, definitively proven is that there is a microbial connection to coordinating this autoimmunity and the the host activity in taking out a very essential uh, function uh, of the pancreas and they they frame the issue in in a couple of different ways that you know I, I'd like to put out these rhetorical questions to the listeners so that they can think about them as the story of this this paper evolves and the first one, is why does autoimmunity or autoimmune-based diseases uh, affect females more than men? I mean, this is this is a conundrum that has driven the rheumatologist uh, crazy. They they don't know why autoimmune disease is more prevalent in in women, and now this is the first story where we're going to begin to see that there is a, a microbial connection. And I'll cut to the chase first. And as the animal develops, this nod mouse develops, and the pups reach puberty, this leads to changes in the gut microbiota that then reinforce testosterone production, which then is protective against the T and B cell responses that are intimately linked to the development of this autoimmune-based disruption of insulin production in these particular mice. Um, Michael, I'm sorry. Let me interrupt you for a second. I admit my profound ignorance of immunology. I tell you that I had never heard of this testosterone effect. Is this a widely known thing? Is this something I should have known? And has it been the, discovered a long time ago, or is this relatively recent? Well, no, the, it's, it's the observation that women are more prone to developing autoimmune disease has been known for, for quite some time. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, the, the linkage to testosterone, I didn't know until I read these two papers, but I'm not an endocrinologist to know whether or not it is regulated to the sex hormone, specifically testosterone, as as we know that um, men and women have testosterone, just like men have estrogen as well. And you know, during puberty, men make more testosterone, and the net consequences um, in this particular paper, they go through a very elegant way of of demonstrating it that the microbiome of the uh, male animal is actually uh, protective of uh, developing the type 1 diabetes. So let, let me um, take you through the paper and uh, de describe it. So the way they raise these animals is they put them in a, uh, these are sp uh, specific pathogen-free mice or SPF mice and uh, specific 
pathogen free means the they ask the question of the mouse of whether or not it has any antibodies against a, a series of, of pathogens. And th it's a long and distinguished list of, of pathogens from everything from avian adenovirus group 1 all the way out to you know, mycoplasma and a couple of species of, of mycoplasma. So the, the vet screens animals for serum titers and so they're, they're effectively pathogen free. But they still have their quote normal flora. Mm -hmm. And so they, they ask a, a very fundamental question first. They ask, um, how long does it take to develop type 1 diabetes? And they ask the question based on sex. And what they find is there, there's about a 2 to 1 ratio. About twice as many females develop type 1 diabetes as opposed to um, males. And they, they measure it out. It's they a big then factor, ask, isn't it? That's an amazingly big factor. Oh yeah, this this is this is apps. You don't need to be a statistician to figure this out. Right. I mean, this is this is my kind of statistics, two to one. And, uh, and if you, you know, if you castrate the males, then yes, they, they get that's more. what I was. I'm sorry. That's what I was getting to. Is if you and they did that really neat experiment. So if you put um, an androgen titrating molecule that's going to suck all the t testosterone away, which is effectively chemical castration, or you castrate the animals like Vincent, or castrate the males like Vincent was just alluding to, um, they develop an equivalent ratio of type 1 diabetes. So there is this testosterone-mediated event. Now, here's the really cool part. So they re-derive this knockout animal, this nod mouse in a germ-free environment. So the, the animal is truly born sterile without any flora. And they raise these animals and they allow them to uh, develop for their full term. And so it's the same experiment. They ask but a, a very simple question, what proportion of, of male animals, which proportion of female animals uh, develop type 1 diabetes? And the answer is there's no difference. So the flora, they, which they these still, animals... They still develop diabetes, but at the same rate, right? At the same rate. Yeah. And it's um, roughly, well, the females in the germ-free and the males in the germ-free uh, reach a plateau at about 40 weeks of about uh, 60%, while the females in the uh, specific pathogen-free, it's about an 80% uh, penetration of that uh, type 1 diabetic phenotype. So this is a, a pretty good model for developing uh, type 1 diabetes. So they, they now have a, and you can well imagine what their next experiment is going to be. Um, what you can do is, and, and this is exactly what these authors did, is they, they ask Alios question about um, testosterone. So they specifically Ask the question about uh, uh, serum testosterone concentrations, and um, they look at the serum uh, testosterone co uh, concentrations, and they found that the serum testosterone concentrations were higher in germ-free versus the specific pathogen-free female. So, in the germ-free system, the females that were germ-free had a little bit higher uh, testosterone levels than they did in the normal flora uh, animal population. And when they asked the question uh, about the specific pathogen-free uh, males, and they looked and they found that the testosterone in the germ-free male sera was, was a, again, higher than it was in the germ-free female sera. So, you know, the, the males are doing what males need to do and the females are doing what females need to do. And they asked the question, did they breed? And the answer was yes. They, they bred and everything was okay. They could make uh, offspring. But the only principal difference between the two populations, if you will, was the presence and absence of um, microbes. Then they did a, an interesting experiment in which they added microbes back to uh, the germ-free animals, and it's um, Shadler flora, which 
those people familiar with germ-free colonies of mice, these are eight particular strains of microbe that the germ-free community adds back to, to mice to uh, effectively mimic some flora. But they, they were able, with this modified Shadler flora, to effectively almost restore the, and I'm going to call the specific pathogen-free wild-type flora for the sake of uh, making things um, simple. Because uh, the story gets uh, complicated. Is the, is the Shadler flora uh, different, or is, the, is, it, is it more male or female? Uh, the Shaler floor is only eight microbes, and, and that takes us to the, the next, next set of figures where they're asking, you know, how are, how are things different? And they're using a technique uh, called principal component analysis, and I always have trouble visualizing things in, you know, multidimensional data plots uh, mm-hmm. in trying to describe these multi-dimensional data plot. So I went out and asked Dr. Google to teach me about um, <laughs> principal component analysis and found two good YouTube videos on trying to understand principal component analysis. And, and what it means is you can begin to analyze multiple variables. And, and one of the things that they were asking the question about is um, they were looking at using mass spectrometry to to look at what's going on in the serum of animals to see whether or not uh, the diabetes was was causing any uh, metabolites to uh, show up and to uh, account for the high proportion of total variability in their data set and this mass spectrometry was looking at uh, 183 serum metabolites, so it's 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 pretty complex in terms of if you're thinking if you're looking at 183 different things. And what they learned is uh, lipid metabolites accounted for the high degree of variability. And and uh, what the endocrinologists are are teaching us is that these two uh, lipids are of importance in uh, diabetes. And so it again goes hand in glove with the the phenotype of the animal, which is diabetic. So to try to simplify this story, they um, took a page from that recent paper in the New England Journal where they were using stool transplantation to um, cure individuals of um, Clostridium difficile mediated colitis. And so they asked the question if we took stools from wild type males and passed those stools to females, could we confer the particular phenotype of protection? Because the male microbiome phenotype was able to protect. And the way they did that experiment is they took three groups of animals, prepubescent animals, pubescent animals, and adult animals, and they mixed and matched the stool from these animals prior to the onset of diabetes. And what they learned is that it's, it's really the adult male flora that uh, confers protection they then began to look at the microbes that were associated with it, again using principal component analysis. And the take home message was um, sexual maturation set the microbiome characteristics that then conferred in the naive female the ability to resist the development of. Um, type 1 diabetes in uh, the germ-free situation. Hey, Michael. And so, yes. So they say that when they did the fecal administration, the changes, that is the, uh, the change in the microbiome, the phenotypic changes are durable for 11 weeks, more or less, but after 34 weeks, they were gone. So what does that mean? It means that once they reach adulthood, I always have trouble remembering if 34 weeks is old for a mouse. 
And I think yeah, that adult, may yeah. be that may be where the hormone levels, the testosterone levels, are are beginning to uh, drop. Does it doesn't mean that the microbiome doesn't take in the female. In other words, what you've given them is, is has a transient colonization, and then it's then it's it's gone. Is that was that what's going on? That there? could be. That could be. Well, in itself, that's very interesting. That it says that there is really a, a selection for. Yeah, different populations. Because I was going to ask you next, Michael, is that why do men and women, why do male and female mice have different gut right. microbiomes? We don't know that, right? No, we we, we don't know that. Hmm. We don't know that at all. Uh, no, I I've forgotten. I, I don't know my microbiomology. <laughs> but is that true for humans? That's, that's a good question. Is there yeah. a <laughs> systematic difference in the in the bugs of males and females in the human? You happen to know? That I don't happen to know, and I didn't try to figure that out. They, the in their manuscript, the authors comment when they move it to um, the human side of things. Uh, recently, what it's been described in the type one insulin diabetic humans is it's actually moving towards younger and younger. Uh, children before there's any uh, sexual differentiation. Typically, mm. it's oh. moved down to five-year-olds. So the whole testosterone issue is is moot. In, in the male-female issue is is moot uh, in the outbred human population. But in this nod mouse, yeah. uh, it was um, quite quite substantial. So but, basically, in humans, you don't see this. This female bias of type one diabetes, right? No, you do. Well, it says do here. See, that it says here in the article that human type one diabetes is not sex biased, perhaps because the peak age at onset precedes puberty. So, with a recent rapid rise in incidence reported in children under five, but it's not sex biased. They say no. It, it, it type one diabetes. I was thought I was misthinking, and I was thinking you were talking about autoimmunity. No, but no, yeah, that's it, a broader it, thing. You yeah. were talking specifically about yeah. type one diabetes. Yeah, and and so as I was reading this paper, I was asking myself a whole series of of questions. Um, specifically, you know, a, a large fraction of of the human population is on birth control pills. Uh. specifically women and so does estradiol change the microflora of of women that's that's question number one i i would have and more and more women are going on birth control pills earlier and earlier in their lives so that's question number one question number two is you only need to turn on the evening news to appreciate that the pharmaceutical companies are advertising testosterone patches for men to restore vitality. And does that then change the microbiome of men as their testosterone levels are naturally waning? Is their microbiome changing sufficiently to have a phenotypic effect in men where uh, some of the other things uh, associated with aging, like muscle wasting and, and other things, can be influenced by um, the microbes. And men do indeed develop autoimmunity uh, later in life. And the question is, is that microbiome mediated? Hmm. And so I was reading this paper and thinking about uh, one of the twins. And one of the sessions I went to that the general meeting in 2007 about this emerging discipline of, of microbial endocrinology and reading this science paper led me to believe that we're going to see a new specialty of medicine develop really called microbial endocrinology where the physician is actually going to need to read via principal component analysis the microbiome of their patient – and then review their genetics to try to understand whether or not they're going to be susceptible to things like type 1 diabetes. And they're going to actually probably begin to do this if there's a family history of type 1 diabetes. 
in younger children because there is no sex bias hmm. and whether or not we'll develop um, probiotic medications hmm. to to do these things because the way they laid out the science in this paper they showed us the principal component analysis and it's just skewing the data to the left and right of this uh, three-dimensional plot looking at the microbes and then and then looking at hormonal levels and and looking at whether or not there's an androgen uh, sink that can suck up these things and what it did to uh, the various metabolites that their mass spec was um, measuring and it really drove home the importance uh, of the microbiome and it I, I remember the twim that we did when we had um, the ER doctor who was talking about urinary tract infections in uh, boys and girls, young boys and girls, in which they would prescribe an antibiotic. And we know from the microbiome analysis that when you give antibiotics, you alter the flora for effectively two years. And is that then also predispose individuals to developing some of these autoimmune-based diseases that wow. are profoundly influenced by the microbiome. And, yeah. you know, he, the doc from um, Camden, Camden yeah. was, yep. you know, pretty much adamant about the importance of prescribing an antibiotic for uh, children so they wouldn't develop essential hypertension earlier than they normally would because of the mm -hmm. damage to the kidney. Yeah. Yeah. And he was arguing for, for studies. But, you know, in, in view of the science paper and the importance of the microbiome, I, I think we really need to begin to think about taking principal component analysis and really introducing it to, to our medical students and, and to our um, graduate students so that they can begin to ask these questions. And, you know, one of the things I'd like the, the general listening audience to think about is um, – or the pharmaceutical industry is, you know, do this experiment. You know, get a stool sample before you put a male on a testosterone patch, determine their microbiome characteristic, and then put them on the testosterone patch and see what their microbiome looks like. And similarly, when you uh, place a woman on a birth control pill, get a stool sample, freeze it, and and determine her microbiome and once she's been on the birth control for a while, then assess what it looks like after that to, to begin to try via principal con component analysis whether or not there is really any difference when we begin to uh, introduce hormones for um, you know particular reasons. Because I think this goes back to uh, the Michelano story where we know the microbes are, are talking amongst themselves. But similar, they're talking to us, and this is 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 but just one paper that came out recently. There was that other paper a few weeks ago about um, the microbes in our gut making uh, chemicals that our sense of smell perceives. So these are uh, chemicals that are produced in our gut that are influencing our uh, blood pressure just okay. simply by odor. Wow. And again, it was dependent upon the microbes in our, our gut influencing uh, blood pressure regulation. Michael, I think we should point out to our listeners that the principal component analysis is done from on data that you get from 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing, right? Correct. The other thing I wanted to point out is you were talking about you know giving people testosterone, right, and the possible influence on the microbiome. But this paper does not really address that, right? What this paper says no. is that the microbiome affects testosterone levels, but we don't know Correct. if testosterone would affect the microbiome, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. Well, that's quite interesting. I, I mean, it's interesting that it, in people already, the, the incidence of diabetes is so high before puberty that you can't tease out a sex difference, right? No. But it's there, right? And so maybe, so that's what we have to do is we have to figure out if there is a correlation with a particular microbiome. But that's hard, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's it's really hard because the, the beauty of the germ-free system that these folks were able to use, even when they added back the Shadler flora, is the fact that 
the human gut is thought to have about a thousand different species, give or take. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's going to be hard to tease out who's important. And, yep. and, and I don't think they, they were able to tease out who's important because they were looking at um, 30 different families yeah. of, of microbes. Um, from the bacteroides to the per- proteobacter to the firmicutes, uh, and uh, they were asking the fold change of control male versus control female and um, fold change of, of giving a male to a female versus the female control, trying to understand if there were any differences, in, and I don't think they found any um, take-home message per se. Yeah, nothing is going to... It's not going to jump out at us. I suspect it's going to be subtle, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great story. I really like that. What do you think, Alio? Well, I'm, I'm not surprised that yeah. microbiome studies should be taking off at such a speed. Yeah. It's now way of life. Yep. <laughs> it's really amazing how fast stuff things are moving. This is exciting. All right. I think we should read a couple of emails. Um before we wrap it yeah, up. Yeah, we haven't done some in a while. Yeah. So let's do a couple here. One is from Jacob, who writes, Hello, I all. saw this media release from the Australian Institute of Marine Science about researchers isolating a combination of probiotic bacteria to assist in preventing vibrio infections of spiny lobsters in aquaculture and thought of TWIM. So he sends us a link to a story where, so this, I guess there's a problem in... Uh, Spine and vibrio infections when you grow lobsters of this type for uh, for food. There's a problem with all PC culture. Yeah, it's lobsters are not fish, but it's the same idea. When you when you put a lot of animals in a small space, that's what happens. Infections happen. So this may be important. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So they have uh, two probiotic bacteria where they protected. They call them mm. PP05 and PP107. I don't know what PP means. Do you guys know? No. No. Nope. It's maybe it's proprietary. <laughs> proprietary or proteobacter. Maybe. Anyway, thanks for that, Jacob. Uh, the next one is from Trudy, who writes, "Dear Twim Team, since the topic of patent law came up on episode forty-eight, I wanted to add my two cents. Six months ago, I switched to a career in patent law after twelve years as a bench virologist." I have found this job to be very challenging and rewarding, and I'm currently experiencing a rather steep learning curve. However, the reason I'm writing is because I did want to mention that one does not have to be a lawyer or even plan to go to law school to practice patent law. Many many firms are willing to hire PhDs with no prior experience in patent law as science advisors or patent agents and train them on the job. The reason they're willing to do that is because of their extensive background in science, which is imperative in this particular legal field. In our firm, all six of all of our six science advisors have PhDs, and three of our five attorneys do as well. Although learning the law is pretty difficult, in my opinion, it is much easier to learn the law on the job than it would be to learn the science. And I have tremendous respect for the two attorneys in our firm who do not have PhDs because they seem to be so well-versed in the science as well. I recently asked one of our partners who has a PhD how much of what he learned in law school has actually applied to this particular job, and he said zero. (laughs) (laughs) On the other hand, attorneys do make a lot more money, and there are certain things that they can do that a patent agent can't do. But my point is that a PhD is more than enough to have a rewarding career in patent law. Personally, I have absolutely no desire to go to law school. Thanks again for continuing to provide so many different stimulating and thought-provoking topics. Well, that's cool. Yeah, Yeah. a couple of our graduate students went to work for patent firms after uh, completing their PhDs um, in lieu of doing a postdoc. Mm -hmm. They then became patent agents, and one of my good friends and, and colleagues um, I, I affectionately say had his midlife crisis and and went and became a patent attorney and um, he was well schooled in uh, HIV and all its associated complexities and um, he went to uh, one of the major firms and was actually representing the patent portfolio for one of the um, major patent holders for 
all the associated products associated with HIV. And so his experience in HIV and retrovirology well served him. Yeah. Well, for those PhDs who are interested in law and don't see a future in uh, research, you should check that out. So thanks for that, Trudy. Uh, the next one is from Jim, who writes, Esteemed Sages. Any of you, uh, Elio, are you an esteemed sage? I'm of course. Not. Post Sandy seems an appropriate time for a twim devoted to mold since the storm generated many opportunities to deal with it. I'm also battling it in my ventilation ducts to the extent that we replaced all the supply lines beneath the house and some of the returns in the attic installed an electrostatic filter upstream from a HEPA filter plus a UV light by the heating cooling coils. Over the years, I've inspected the duct work for integrity and cleanliness and just didn't think we had conditions that allowed mold growth until we found seven of 23 supply lines, each of which looked inside like they were spray-painted with black primer. Meanwhile, outside, we've been unable to prevent black mildew from growing in playing card patches on treated wood coated with mildew side infused stain and exposed to sunlight about eight hours a day. I bought five mold collection kits containing Petri dishes and growth medium just before detecting the seven register lines. At first, they seemed a good idea to apply now and perhaps in the spring or summer, but then I found this site which he links to with considerable mold information that seems reputable. My interpretation of what the site says is that conditions and materials contributing to mold must be removed to fix the problem. While removing bad ductwork helps, I don't think it corrects the condition problems. The site says sprays and chemicals don't work, and sampling with my kits followed by lab work to identify mold types won't tell if harmful molds is at levels requiring action. In addition, unless you use laboratory-grade filtration, it won't reduce the presence of mold to livable levels, and UV irradiation is only good directly under the light, not particulates flying by. Electrostatic filters apparently only remove a small amount of mold-related material, as do good filters, but not all, and probably enough for sensitive people. Plus, they work best if the ventilation fans run continuously. Much harmful mold material is too heavy to get sucked into any ventilation system anyway, and is only removed by vacuuming often, mopping, and washing fabrics. Finally, only an expensive, trained environmental specialist can do a good evaluation, prescribe corrective action, and determine if that action has been effective. The site shows we have just one such specialist in my state, Virginia, about 300 miles away. Mm -hmm. Do you folks agree our best approach would be to napalm the house and replace <laughs> it with a stainless steel cube or wear environmental protection suits or move to who knows where? Of course, the guys doing all the ventilation work used no respiration protection, but then they were all in their 20s and 30s versus our 70s. So what's going on with mold nowadays anyway? Is there more of it? I have no problem understanding why you need to remove wet and moldy plasterboard and carpeting, but have seen home shows where mildew-stained woodwork behind the wallboard is sprayed with something which they implied would fix the problem. You're the only really reliable source of complete and competent knowledge on the topic, so many of your listeners should appreciate your comments. Well, I'm flattered. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that I know anything about it. Why is there mo more mold? Is it true, Elio, there's more mold around nowadays than before, or is it just we're just seeing it? I would think that the main variable for the amount of mold is humidity. Yeah. I have no idea if there's more, you know, we have, do we have, is our climate more humid? I don't really know. It's about the... Um, air conditioning uh, heat exchangers. And we use Freon to do the temperature differential. And in the winter months, um, the liquid is, is very hot. And um, any of you who have heat pumps will appreciate that the heat that comes out of a heat pump is never really hot. You, you can do this experiment at home by just standing on the discharge duct and generally, it, it's no more than um, 110 to 120 degrees, depending upon how efficient the, the heat exchange is. And 110 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit really um, doesn't do all that much to taking out uh, spores. So the, hmm. the spore lives on that heat exchanger. And in the summer months, um, the heat exchanger is cooled to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and then water or humidity uh, condensates. And the drip pan underneath the air conditioner duct 
uh, is really one of the troubling spots. You think there's more? Is it because we have more air conditioners, more heat exchangers? I don't know. It's the heat pump phenomena. We've we've yeah, but gone. The, but the question is: Is that a change? No, I think change. I think the amount of mold is that the the number of spores they come from the outside, and our houses are much tighter than they used to be because mm. um, many municipalities require that the house be wrapped in in Tyvek, which is um, you know impermeable to um, gas exchange. And so the the spores really can't get out as easily as that they used to get out, and so it's um, it's a problem. Um, we we studied uh, a problem, and I published two papers on looking at um, air conditioning, looking at our our copper story, and they recently came out. One came out in Current Micro, where we looked at copper exchangers and and aluminum exchangers to see what was growing on the heat exchangers, looking at molds and other things. And the other was in an um, air conditioning journal, uh, specifically looking at uh, how to control these things. And it's it's a really, really hard problem, especially once the mold uh, takes root, because the, the, the spores, you know, are spores, and, you know, they'll resist many of the chemicals, and they'll resist drying, and they'll come back, and... So it is a conundrum. So so napalm uh, is the, so napalm is the way to go. Yeah. So I meant to ask you, Vincent, what have you done with <laughs> your restoration? Are you still pounding nails or? Well, we got so we have two uh, houses on our on our property down there that were that were affected by the hurricane. We have the front, which is the main house, that's all fixed and livable now. That didn't get any water in it because I had a crawl space underneath, so that's fixed. We've had a contractor go down there. But we have a back house, a small cottage, which got flooded and the water came halfway up the walls. And um, that we have to work on in the spring. The electricity has to be replaced. And uh, we have to take out the insulation, which got moldy, of course. We threw out all the rugs and everything. But there's a lot of work to do there. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's okay. It's, uh, you know, we're all okay. So it's just the house. So... um, Michael, copper doesn't help if you put copper over everything. Let's say you had copper air ducts. I know it's too expensive. Would that take care of the situation? Uh, the the copper heat exchangers work remarkably well at controlling um, yeah. biofilm development on the heat exchanger, and you're you're discharging it. There's two fundamental issues that people have. One, active mold that is growing, so it's a constant uh, replenishment, and then. Whether or not folks are allergic, and you, they can even be dead, and the dead bodies of the mold can actually aggravate your, your allergies. And so that's when the electrostatic filters come in. And many of the air conditioning companies are experimenting with um, UV light and uh, electrostatically charged filters. But it's all about contact time and how fast the flow rate is. Because remember, if you're exposing it to... Uh, a lethal agent, the ultraviolet has to hit mm. the fungus. And if the velocity of the air conditioner duct is such that you have insufficient time of the fungus with the ultraviolet light, you don't deliver enough energy to knock out the DNA because that's, a, after all, what the ultraviolet light is going to be doing is knocking out yeah. uh, the DNA. And we've tried all sorts of variations of, of um, copper filters but it's a fundamental issue of back pressure where you have to make a torturous path in order for the fungi and the bacteria to encounter the biocidal material, whether it be ultraviolet light, hydrogen peroxide, or even copper. It has to hit yeah, in order right. to damage the microbe. And so it's um, because you don't have a density like a liquid culture. You have a much less concentration, and so it's really hitting it with that magic bullet that's going to kill the fungus or kill the bacterium. And bacteria are much harder to kill because they're smaller. Fungi being bigger, they're a little bit easier to hit. Mm. 
All right. Well, uh, speaking of copper, our next email, which will make our last, is from Don, who writes, When do we get to hear the results of Michael's experiments and interventions with copper and microbes? The suspense is killing me, or did I miss it? Please continue your marvelous podcasts. Well, the the short answer to the question is we we've gotten the galleys back, and it it uh, according to the most recent galley, it's going to be published at the end of March electronically, and then the embargo is over, and we can talk freely about it. Oh, Unfortunately, the journal we're publishing in isn't like Science with Rosie Redfeld, where she was able to you know fully post her results and and talk about them, and you know that's one of the things I I think. Um, would be nice for science is you could post your your manuscript and it wouldn't inhibit your ability to to discuss it yeah. and, and embargoes you know you can understand why journals want embargoes they they want to be able to drive people to subscribe and to to read their journal but um i i found when we discussed the arsenic story um it was it was really pretty nice to be able to to listen to the discussion and so hopefully the next few TWIMs will be able to, to discuss. Um, there are yeah. two papers coming out in the May issue of Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology that will specifically address the clinical applications of right. uh, copper. So at the end of March, they'll be online, so we can do it after We that. can do it. Oh, that's yes. great. Very good. There yeah. you go. Thank you. All right. That's uh, TWIM54, and you'll find this episode just like all the others at microworld.org slash twim and also over at iTunes. And if you enjoy what we do, one of the things you can do to help us is to go over to iTunes and uh, rate our show there. You can give us some stars or put a comment, and that helps to keep us visible in the podcast directory over at iTunes. We do love to get your questions and comments. We'll slowly get to our backlog. You can send them to twim at twiv.com. TV. Elio Schechter can be found at his wonderful blog, Small Things Considered. Thanks for joining us today, Elio. My pleasure. I'm glad I'm back. Good to have you back. It's fun. <laughs> Michael Schmidt can be found in Charleston, South Carolina at the Medical University. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Vincent, and welcome back, Elio. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at my blog, which is at virology.ws. Many thanks to the American Society for Microbiology for supporting TWIM, and in particular Chris Condian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music that you hear at the beginning and end of TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Thank you.